welcome everybody here. Um, thank you for choosing New Spirit um, as your choice of, or your place of study here this morning. Um, if you've been following the last few weeks, uh, we've been uh, we've been in the Book of James, and uh, just to give you a quick synopsis about uh, James, uh, a lot of people t uh, oftentimes confuse uh, the author of James as the disciple, but in fact, James was the half brother of Jesus, and uh, he he came to um, belief after the resurrection. Um, it, a lot of times people think, oh, well, he was always a believer from the beginning whenever, you know, he grew up with Jesus, but in fact, that was not the case. Uh, and so James later became a believer after, you know, his, his he saw Jesus resurrect. And so um, for several years, um, people or after the resurrection, James was the only book of guidance. And in fact, a lot of uh, scholars um, believe that James is the oldest book in the New Testament. And so, um, of course, we're gonna be, um, we're, we're following along with the last few, uh, these next few chapters here. Um, chapter three is going to be a very uh, interesting uh, topic of discussion, but uh, before I begin, uh, I wanted to go ahead and say another prayer before we get started. Lord Father, we come to you this morning, thanking you for allowing us to gather freely for us to study your word, Lord. And Lord, it is, it's not I who speak uh, this truth, Lord. It is, it's only through you that you've allowed me to speak what you have placed in my heart. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would just allow your spirit to, to dwell today here and for us to, to learn more about what you have to say to us. Uh, we thank you for, for all the great things that you do for us at each and every day. We ask all these things in your son's precious name, amen. And so, so chapter, so chapter three, um, and if you're reading, if, if you're following the book of James, James discusses various different topics. So uh, chapter three is called Taming the Tongue. And you'll see why here um, as, we, uh, as we read along. And so, um, if I could get somebody, a volunteer, to read for me, James, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Thank you. So we see here James is switching topics. Uh, you know, in the previous week, uh, we saw about, um, you know, faith and works, and he's talked about not showing favoritism, but now he's talking about, you know, uh, taming the tongue. Now, notice in verse 1, um, what, it, it, it's very, very striking to hear what James has to say here in verse 1. It says, not many of you should presume to be teachers. Uh, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Uh, so, comments are about this verse here. Um, it, th does does anything stick out to you? Like, what what exactly is James trying to say here? Um, is he implying that no nobody should be allowed to teach? Is that what he's saying? Because you know he he is saying um, you should not presume to be teachers. Uh, is that what James is implying here? Is what he's talking about? Any any thoughts or questions so far? I think it's more about that when you do teach, that you need to pray and in, and ensure that it's biblical, in in every way when you do teach that that we're not teaching just off on a whim. Yeah, and uh, when you're reading when you're reading this verse for the first time. You may be confused and say, well, maybe James is, is discouraging people from teaching. But uh, on the contrary, James is warning against those who may be ambitious to teach. You know, you may meet, meet people who, you know, are anxious to serve or they, they, they want to be in a leadership position to teach. But James is, is, is instructing those who, who are like that to be very mindful because uh, you you know, you can't force yourself in a position to teach because of an opportunity there. So James is, is talking about, you know, those who are ambitious, who those who seek to be in that authoritative position. And so when 
when when those who when you and it it implies more on uh, teaching uh, scripture here. So like uh, for example, like those who uh, who have a calling to teach, who uh, who felt led to go and you know to teach. Uh, that's not what James is talking about. He's talking about those who don't have that innate nature to go up and teach. It's almost like they. They feel forced, like they want to seize that opportunity for themselves to be in that position, and so, and James is warning those too for those who, who, who kind of who force themselves in that leadership role, uh, they're going to be held more accountable because they're they're in a position, and as me as my obligation, I have to to teach in a truthful way that is. Not con and that doesn't contrast to get what's truth, and so it's it's very important for people and in and, and, and more specifically teachers who are in these positions to to not go uh, based off their own pers uh, pre assumptions. They have to be mindful of what they're teaching because they're in charge of leading others in a spiritual way that. If they're being, if they're not teaching in a faithful manner, they're going to be held more accountable against God. Because I don't want to be ever in a position where I I instruct somebody uh, of a wrong, I, I instruct them uh, something that is not biblically correct, and then I'm held accountable because I'm the one who's in that position who's teaching uh, those other people. And so uh, James is talking about those who um, who who tend to be more ambitious in this in this way. And I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I think I have a way he's telling you don't take it very light. You need to be prepared. You need to, to, to be prepared to, to teach. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, and of course when you're when you're teaching, uh, there there does come a level of preparation. You know, I, I think, you know, if, if you're going up there, and it, and it goes the same thing too when you're preaching because you can't go up there and just, you know, just not have any prepared. Uh, you just go up there unprepared. You know, you have to be able to and, be and, able to. You know, and right now I have clients that they are leaders, that they are teachers, that they are pastors. And sometimes they say, well, you know, I just see something in YouTube, you know, and, and they have the idea of somebody else. And, and they just bring that to, and I think that James, like, Not, and, and I think it goes back to the, the um, you know, the gifts, you know, the spiritual gifts, because I have seen some teachers that they shouldn't be teaching, right? Because you, you see that's not their the spiritual gift, you know, and I, you know, and, and, and also on another side, <coughs> sometimes I see people that they should be a teacher. And uh, I think that, that that's, in my opinion, that's what I see the whole concept yeah and when and when this and when this verse was written in in the greek it says do not force yourself into a role of teacher and so uh, james is talking about those people who who force themselves in that position when they shouldn't and so i think that whenever we, we read the greek that's what's what it's implying but i agree there as well because there, there's there's times where people shouldn't even be up there they're they're leading others astray, and of course that that can create a lot of a series of problems. So I, I love what Bonnie just said. I think also when you think about this, and you know, it, within the life of the church, you know, we as leaders uh, or any leaders in the church need to also be mindful about that. You know, she mentioned the spiritual gifts. Not everyone has the spiritual gifts for certain things. So as a leader, you need to be very careful about approaching someone and asking, hey, you know, would you be interested in doing this ministry or being within this ministry? Because they may not have the spiritual gift for it. We have to be mindful of that as leaders, you know, pray about it. But I, I love it, and I'll use this as an example. In all the years of being part of praise and worship ministry, and not just here, I'm talking the last 20 something years, what I have always observed is we will not go and necessarily approach people about, you know, hey, you know, come and join us, that type of thing. What 
seems to really work best and you know is spirit led is when someone comes to you as being like in the praise and worship, right? Someone comes and approaches and says, I, I feel in my heart like the Lord is, 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 is bringing me to, to come talk to you. I feel like, you know, I wanna be part of this, you know. It's those people that have that feel, that call, they're, they're, that's a spirit thing, you know? And, and, and when that happens, when those types of things happen, those are the folks that last. Those are the folks that are going to put the effort in. Those are the folks that are going to come to the practices. Those are the folks who are going to practice their craft, you know, whether it's an instrument or singing or what have you, because they have a heart for it. And that's the gift that, that they've been given to, to serve the Lord. Um, it, and, and it just, you know, I use that as an example, but, you know, as, as, as church um, leaders, we need to be mindful of that. Mm-hmm. And I think on the other side too, and I, I appreciate you mentioning that, I sometimes you may have a, a person who may have the talent to do so, but they mm-hmm. don't come with the right spirit in mind. It's almost like they come in and they they want the accolades, they want people to you know to be impressed by their um, by their abilities to do that. And I think also too, it, it needs to stem from a a, a spiritual desire to do not based on them that glorifies them but you know the father exactly. and so in every ministry whatever it is whatever it is that you're doing it's not about you because it's not even your ministry it's the lord's ministry and the work that you're doing is for the lord and that's the way we need to approach everything Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. all right did anybody other had a hand up i just sat on what the brother Val was commenting where it's like has to like the person has to come up but in a way also like our leaders or pastors uh they they're put there by god to help a person i guess see i guess lead them into their call or or or, you know yeah like you know help them out like i don't know like it, it kind of guide them, and sometimes people will find their calling or or, or where they're supposed, you know, as a as a maybe a youth pastor, as a, a a children's teacher, or serving here, serving there, you know. Mm-hmm. Is, is is that part of discipleship? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, I believe discipleship is is part of that building up and encouraging those to. Uh, to, to seek what God has in store for them because we're all called to do good works and for any of those who you know they come to church and they don't they feel like well I don't have any spiritual gifts I don't you know they, for those people out there you know God has a, a use for each and every single one of us it's up to us where we have to answer that call and um, discipleship builds off of that um, that building up and strengthening for you know for those um, who are seeking you know to their guidance you know in other words you know what brother jose that is you know i'm going to say a really very uh, practical example you know so many times people uh, pastors leaders they see something in in, in you know in members that sometimes we, we we don't even see themselves you know and i'm going to do the example of marco you know he didn't want it at the beginning he didn't want it to be a teacher and you know why so many people fail because it's like it's not that they they feel like man I have to study I have to prepare I have to invest this time no never mind you know and and Mark was like well let me pray about it let me pray about it and and my husband saw something special then he was like yeah you know would you need to pray about it and if God told you then you need to prepare because you never you know if you remember his first lesson and now how God is using him and how it's you know, mm-hmm. so definitely that comes with discipleship, and my husband sat down with him and teach and know and give him, uh, you know, books to those are commentaries and uses to research, and and I hear him warning him, I don't want you just go to YouTube, I don't want you to you you need to go and find and see and come to me, so definitely that is a lot. He saw mm-hmm. something in him, and then you know Marco was humble and say, well, let me pray about it. And if God, mm-hmm. even though sometimes we feel uncomfortable, and I think that nowadays I see people finding, oh, you know, it's not coming from God because it, it takes discipline and, and sacrifice. 
you know, sometimes we are doing something and Marcos, I know I need to come here for my study. And he can join us, you know, if we're watching yes. a TV or we're doing whatever, you know, he needs to go over there. And there were so many people that they said, well, you know, no, that's probably, that's not what that was because, mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot. I'm so stressed out. Oh, yeah. that's a lot. And sometimes we confuse that. No, yes, and there there won't be, there won't come a time where I feel like I've reached, you know, where I need to be. There's always, when you're a teacher, there's always a moment for us to improve and for us to build and learn more. And, of course, I think that's just part of being, you know, a, a teacher is where you'll never, there never cease a time where you'll stop learning, you know, yourself. And, you know, it, it's definitely, I felt that way, you know. No, amen. And that's all of us. That's all of us. That's everyone. We... As Christians, we're, we should never get to a point to think that we know everything about the Bible or about the character of God. We should always have that that spirit of learning and growing in Christ until we until He calls us home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there, there are countless examples of you know we 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 love to talk about you know Paul how great Paul was as far as what he did, but. He could have not have done any of that had it not been for God who gave him that ability for him to, to do what he had to do. And he changed the world. He, he, he changed lives and he, he made a big impact. But it was only because of um, his accepting of his calling through God. And God used him in a, you know, a mighty way. And you know, it, it goes for those who, you know, who follow, who, who, call, who answer the call. Uh, of obedience. Uh, and there's been some great comments. I don't want to uh, say too much here because uh, there's been some great comments said. But but one thing I do want to note is that here James is speaking on the exclusivity of this ministry. Yeah. That, that's specifically what he's speaking on the, in this context. Notice in verse one, not many of you. He's speaking on the exclusivity. Mm -hmm. You you said a very good important point. Uh, so I'm really impressed because you said uh, should not force yourself. I thought okay, he's doing some reading here. Um, that's really the Greek. You should not force yourself to become teachers. Go to any church and say, hey, who's trying to force themselves to clean the bathrooms? <laughs> hey, who here is fighting over, uh, you know, helping with the children's ministry? Who here is, is, is wrestling and, no, I'm going to vacuum. No, I'm going to vacuum. Nobody. Why? Because those ministries, those areas of service don't bring any attention. Mm -hmm. But there's, what James is saying here is, is this one here is tempting for people, especially those who want to be in front of others. Uh, there's this th there's this temptation. I think Val was right. I think in the in the worship ministry, that's another one. When you're in front of people, we want to show off, and he's like, "Hey, that that's not why you do this." Yeah. And you know, I still think of Plato's uh, phrase that I've shared with you: "Wise men speak when they have something to say, but fools speak because they feel they have to say something." Mm -hmm. And 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 there's many times people want to get up and they want to impress others and. And, and they do the very opposite. They, they, they do damage. And so he says, this is an exclusive ministry that is reserved for those called by God. But notice verse 2. Uh, he's not just talking about researching and doing all the work, but living it. Mm -hmm. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in, in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. In other words, I'll take a person who is not very strong in the word, but is committed to it, but living and walking right with God. Then some person who's acting acting a fool out in the world, but boy, they, they can preach and teach the word. There's a lot of, of showcasers, but but God sees through all that, and he won't bless that. And so I, I think it comes both ways. You have to have that that uh, you know that um, preparation and that devotion to the word and commitment to pre uh, preparing, but you also be you have to be about that life too. Amen. You can't just teach it; you have to live it. Yeah, it comes with that spiritual maturity in order for you to. Yeah, and and that goes back to what Jose said about about discipleship, um, and 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 Marty's right. Uh, as as a pastor and the leaders here, I'll see something in somebody. I'll say, Hey, you have that gift. Get on in there. Like, no, we're gonna sit down and we're gonna take you now. Once you see the gift, that's just step one. But so many churches, they just throw them in. They're like, No, no, we're gonna sit down and we're gonna go through this together. And I'm going to guide you in this, and and that's the discipleship that Jesus calls all of us to do. And and uh, uh, and, and you're a good, good example of that. Um, you were hesitant because you saw how serious it was. And when you said that, it's like I don't know, sir. I'm this this is a big deal and everything. I went. That's why I see that in you. If you would have been, yeah, 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 I'll go. I'll just go ahead and do it next week. I would have been more worried. But you didn't. You saw the seriousness of your of, of of that calling. 
And, and, and the thing is, is, isn't it just as serious to serve in any other way? I mean, no matter what we do, the shame is when a person walks into the church, is going to the church, is a member of that church, and is not serving in any kind of way. And, and, and that's because they say, well, yeah, I want to serve, but I want to serve my way. Well, no. You know, a lot of people don't know this, and I'm not saying it to boast or anything like that, but when Monty and I first uh, went to, to the, 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 the prior church, I saw a need. You know where I first started serving? I cleaned the bathrooms. I had just walked in. Nobody knew me. So I said, hey, does anybody clean the bathrooms? No, I'll do it. That's how God wants us to start. Start by serving in a way that glorifies God, not yourself. And then God will grow you and develop you. Uh, be, be quick to listen and learn and develop. And, and that's really what we hope in the church, that people begin to say, I'll serve in any kind of way that I can, wherever God is calling me. But we shouldn't serve where God doesn't want us to serve. And certainly not in the way that we want to serve. Because uh, that's a problem. People say, well, I'm serving God. Are you serving God the way he wants you to? Or according to your own terms? Because that happens a lot in church, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oftentimes that is the case. Did you have a comment? Um, Irby kind of touched on it. I was just going to give an example, again, just with the praise and worship, because I'm familiar with it and I've, I've experienced it. Mm-hmm. But he said it, uh, and the example I was going to give is when someone comes and, and, and they want to join, you know, I would... I would rather take the person who has the heart mm-hmm. than the person who comes and is like maybe been playing guitar for 20 years and, and it's like super awesome, but yet their heart isn't really in it. You see what I'm saying? Because it's, it is, it's, it's, it's a, it's a uh, when you join a ministry, again, it's not your ministry, it's the Lord's ministry and you're supposed to bring your best. And so uh, there's a lot that goes into that. Yeah, and uh, that all stems from a, a discipleship. It's you know, interpreting, you know, who is really serious about their calling and who those who are just wanting to be in there for the, the spotlight. And so I think that's a big difference. But yeah, but thank you. Thank you all for your the comments. So um, moving, moving on to verse three here. So we had talked about verse two here, you know, that we all stumble many ways. Verse three, uh, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take, for example, ships in verse 4. Although they are so, uh, so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small root, uh, rudder wh- wherever the pilot wants to go. What is James talking about here? So here we talk about, uh, you know, about the, the seriousness of, of teaching, uh, uh, stumbling, and now he's, he's talking about... Uh, bits of metal in horses and then a small rudder uh, for large ships so it, it is is james like is is james just kind of being spontaneous here like uh any comments about what what we're reading here because i mean we, we seem to be t- talking about different things here well we see here verse three uh you know and y'all for those who are familiar with with horses you you know how fast and strong and you know, mighty these horses can be, and you know it's it's by for those who work with horses, you may understand like it's not it's hard to to tame a horse by itself, but as soon as you put a, <coughs> you know that that piece of metal in their mouths, that bit of metal, man, it's like you can you've tamed the horse in a way where you can lead it wherever you wanted to go, and then the same thing goes for ships. You know, you see these large, massive ships. Thousands of, of pounds of, 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 you know, of, of these, these wooden ships, you know, and, you know, just a small little rudder, something so small is able to, to, to tame that huge ship. And regardless of how strong the winds may be or the water, um, years, the captain behind that rudder is able to navigate that ship wherever it needs to go. So wh- why is James uses this as an example? Where do you think he's trying to go with this? Is there a reason why he's given this example here? Like, uh, does this any does any of this really make sense? Is what he's talking about? I think, brother, it's to point out the importance of the role of a teacher, uh, the influence that one single teacher has amongst many. Right? Mm-hmm. It's um, what you say, what comes out of your mouth should be spirit led. Hence, the reason we have verses one and two. But if what comes out of your mouth is of your own. 
this is where you can steer, uh, in, in, in this case, where you can steer the church uh, or lead them astray. I think that's that's what uh, James is talking about here. Just that little bit of, uh, you know, a rudder or a piece of steel can lead an entire church or entire community uh, astray. I think you made a, a, I think you made a really great point there, brother, because, you know, something small like, a, you know, like our, our tongues, you know, it's a small part of our bodies, but with our tongue, we're able to do a lot of great things. You know, we, we can go up there and inspire a nation. Uh, we can uh, go, uh, we can talk, uh, you know, we can inspire people. We can give words of encouragement. And at the same time, you know, uh, something small uh, can, you know, can do mighty things. You know, and uh, I always think of the example of uh, the atom bomb. You know, it, it, I don't know if y'all saw Oppenheimer, but, you know, we saw uh, how the development of the hydrogen bomb, you know, and as, it, the, the, you know how small atoms are? They're so microscopic. They're so naked to the, the human eye. You're not able to see them. You have to be able to, to, to use a microscope to see uh, uh, the, the bomb, the, the, the atom um, the atom itself and when that atom split it makes this huge explosion beyond our any sort of capability you know larger than any explosion that we we can uh, we can fathom and so I think James is talking about how something small can be used uh, something small can use uh, be used in a mighty way and go with me to Matthew chapter 17 verses 20 through 21. So, again, and um, it, it, we see examples of how James is using this, um, he's using this visualization uh, to give people an example. He, he wanted to use this as an example for those to see how something small can be a used, uh, it can be used to move um, something great and, and big. So, does anybody have Matthew 17, verses 20 to 21? He said to them, Because of your little faith, you truly, I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of, of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be uh, impossible for you. Amen. How interesting how uh, we, we see a connection between James and, and, and Jesus where he uses something as small as a mustard seed to represent our faith, to uh, enable for us to move something as immovable as a mountain. And the same thing goes to um, our, sometimes we may doubt ourselves, um, you know, we may not think, you know, we may not be able to do any difference, but um, by our own tongues, we're able to do so much great things. And it, it, it's, it's evident because uh, what comes out of our mouth, if we're able to inspire a church, if we're able to speak truth, God will use that small tongue to do something great. It, it changes lives. Do you realize how important the tongue can be? It can be the difference between uh, salvation and damnation. And so it, it, it's really important for us as teachers to remember this because what, what comes out of our mouths can be the difference between um, saving those who are lost and discouraging those to be uh, to walk away and you know to, to, to not find where they need to be I, I think in the same aspect it, that's why he's warning people also because something so small can do so something so great but it can also be just the opposite and be very destructive mm -hmm. and you're gonna see here in the next few verses in fact let's go there Brother, so verse 5, it says, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider that a great forest is set, by, uh, set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. So, the same thing goes as well on the contrary. You know, the, the tongue has a mighty power, and if it's misused 
the wrong way, it can be uh, liable for spiritual arson, in other words. And so we, we see how, and I'm going to name you a few things that we can oftentimes do, um, you know, or non-believers can do oftentimes, can, you know, is gossip, is lying, or, you know, criticism, or even blasphemy. Are those things that we've experienced or, you know, we see people do? You know, it, on the contrary, you know, th those things can oftentimes be worse and they can do damage, you know, and just and all it comes from just speaking out of, you know, a person's mouth, that can oftentimes be the case. But, uh, you know, on the other side, if we if we don't do these things, if we can learn how to control our tongues, you know, we can uh, we can do great things. We can uh, inspire those. We can uh, we can pro uh, proclaim the truth and. You know, we I, I think of uh, Elijah on that mountain, you know, where um, he was challenging a nation. You know, we, we see examples of Elijah who uh, he called on uh, heaven, uh, the fire of heaven. You know, he, he by his words, uh, it, it, it shook a nation. It, it, it showed people how mighty his God was when he had the faith, as small as a mustard seed, you know, despite all of the the people around him you know and we, we and you can go back and read the account of elijah and where he had that small faith in order for him to stand up against against all odds and to proclaim to those that his true god was greater than any other of, of their other pagan gods that they were worshiping at the time and so his his faith allowed for him to uh, to call upon higher from heaven because of that faith and trust in God, and it showed, and, and it showed how powerful his his tongue was, and it, it, it goes to the same thing for us as well. When we can learn how to use uh, our mouths to to you know to speak truth and to inspire those and not do any of these things, you know we can make a difference, and you know it, it, it's evidence as far as what we've seen. Um, you know, time and time again, but uh, I'm hoping this makes sense, or if there's any confusion or questions, uh, just let me know. I think what you're saying is an encouragement always wins. I think that's one of them. And I think as a, my example with my life and my kids is, you know, I, I'm really striving to do that more often versus, you know, I can, all day I think we can pick out the negative in people and, you know, it's not to say to be aware and acknowledge that's okay we gotta watch that or this or that but words of encouragement go such a long way um, instead of just telling people what they're doing wrong and um, it's okay to correct I think that's a good thing but um, I know that I've been I've been guilty of it in my past as a parent and so um, I'm working on that encouragement from my babies I love mm -hmm. you. yeah and James is, is he's um he's really uh, driving home the point here in verse in verse 6, he's saying it's capable of corrupting the whole body. You know, um, it, 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 when he says this, you know, for, I mean, it, when we want to accept Christ, when, we, when, when we're presented the, the salvation, the, um, you know, when, when Paul talks about the steps of receiving salvation, you know, you, pro, you, um, you proclaim with your, you know, with your mouth, you know, Jesus is Lord and my Savior, but, you know, and it has to, it has to come from us at our ability to speak and to accept that gift. But for those who, you know, who, who don't, who don't know how to tame their tongue, and they, they can often, they can reject this, the same, that same blessing. You know, they can, they can go up and say, well, I. I, I choose not to accept God or, you know, I, I reject your, your, you know, your salvation as far as what you're presenting. Well, by your own words, you've now condemned your whole, your whole spiritual body now. You know, you, you just from your proclaiming of your words, you've now uh, rejected the, the, the holy sanctified gift that was presented. And so it, it's really, it, James is really talking about the seriousness of you know our our words sometimes and so um it, it, and in the same manner it can be the same way on the contrary where we um are by our own words it can it has the power for us to save you know and again the thief on the cross another example where 
You know, he didn't have to do any of... He, he, he lived a, a, a reckless, uh, you know, violent life. But at, the, at, this, at his closing moments of his life, all he had to do was say, I believe. By his own tongue, he, he, he says, Lord, surely remember me when I go up to, to paradise with you. And Jesus saved that man on the cross. Amen? Amen. He, by his own words, he, he used his tongue to, to, to accept Christ. And, you know, and, and oftentimes, you know, we consider that man to be the luckiest man on who ever lived. But, you know, it just goes to show how mighty the tongue can be. You know, it can be the difference between you spending eternity in paradise or you can be eternally damned into the fiery pits of hell. That's the seriousness of what James is talking about. Yeah. Uh, comments or questions before I continue? Uh, even in the beginning, brother, uh, God spoke and He created. Uh, there's there's a, a big there's a there's power behind uh, speaking, right? And whether it's for good or evil, you know. And uh, a lot of times, what He's talking about here is, you know, if you think of other uh, beliefs per se, right? And again, I don't want to mock Muslims or but I just want to use that as an example is majority of what their beliefs are is somewhat almost like a twist of the entire Bible right so you can kind of you see that as, as, as an example to say okay someone taught maybe learned Christianity but taught it differently or taught it wrong right mm -hmm. and now we've created now that uh, maybe that one person created an entire religion completely against Christianity. I think you've made, you touched on very something very important because um, his misinterpretation of scripture, and then he goes out and he teaches those, uh, that gets passed down for generations. Right. Mm -hmm. And eventually you get to a point where you form a completely radical different uh, religion. Mm -hmm. And all it stemmed for was a misinterpretation of scripture. And then using his tongue to speak and teach those uh, around him that eventually that inspired a huge movement this new faith this new religion yeah. and so it, it can be the same thing too and I, I think of uh, Adolf Hitler was another example brother you know yeah. he how how can a broke painter turn all of us use his tongue to to lead an entire nation an entire army and he almost ruled the world by his own his own mouth he was able to inspire a huge nation in order for him to almost conquer the world and so it, it I mean again that, that just goes to, to show the power of the tongue but when used in the wrong way you know when we can apply it in the right way we can we can move mountains we can inspire those we can save the lost and so it really just goes to show how powerful we we uh, this our tongues can be and we need to learn how to tame it I really like uh the example that Steve gave because I remember when Brother Irby brought the study of Islam the Wednesday evenings and he brought up the Quran and he showed us where in the Quran it exactly contradicts the, the true word of God so it, it goes to what everyone is saying here it, it, he pointed those scriptures out to us and so it's so true yeah and uh, th think of this also brother the, the serpent you know, in the Garden of Eden, you know, he, he, was, he was playing, you know, he was using his words to, to confuse Adam and Eve. And then by, his, by his, him speaking that, he caused man and, you know, and he ushered in sin to the world. Yeah. Yeah. And, and his power, you know, Paul talks about salvation. If you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, you will be saved. Why yeah. is that? Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. You know, our our words mean have power, and when we're in a leadership position, we need to we need to be mindful of that because there are those who are seeking the truth. They're they're lost. They don't know as far as what to, to believe. They're being told different things. But when whenever those and I think of Jesus's ministry, you know, they oftentimes say nobody spoke like this man. You know, people who are coming to to accept this new faith. They heard something different about Jesus because he was different. He wasn't teaching like everybody else was. You know, he he was he was filled with the truth 
and his ability to to speak uh, to to crowds and for him to inspire his disciples to eventually become what we have as our Christian faith. And so it just goes to show the mighty power of, you know, our tongues. And I'll go ahead and I'll kind of finish off here with uh, on a positive note here in verses 9 through 12. You know, we see here, um, or in verse 8 actually, uh, but no man can tame the tongue. It is restless evil full of deadly poison. So on the other, on, uh, on going back to the other the part, you know, where we can oftentimes in verse 7, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea can be tamed, but who can be tamed, who can tame the tongue? So, you know, James is using this example as, you know, we can, we can tame mighty horses and ships and all different types of animals, but who can tame the tongue? You know, it's like those who are lost, who don't know how to use the tongue, you know, in a, in a way for it to be useful or, you know, to be good. And so when used in the wrong way, it's, it's full of deadly poison, you know, and, you know, we, we talked about, you know, with, with that example with Islam and with, you know, with, with, uh, with, with, uh, with lies. And on the, on the contrary, verse 9, with the tongue we praise the Lord, the Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeliness. Out of the same mouth, verse 10, come praise and cursing. Did you see the difference, the, the, you know, the, 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 the two contrasting differences? My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Or can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So James is using this example for those who are genuine in their words, you know. You may meet people, those who, you know, who may, their actions may be contrary to their words, but by their, uh, if, you know, by their truth, you will know, like, who is, you know, who is genuine, who's not. And so he's, James is using these two examples, like, uh, you know, with the figs and with the salt water. You, you'll know those, you'll know, um, you know the difference between uh, those who are genuine, who's not. And so, it, and uh, it, it goes back to where we were talking about earlier with, you know, the, the tongue, you know, we, we ne need to learn how to tame our tongues and be mindful. And even as those who maybe have families or who may have relatives, uh, we need to be careful as far as what we share. Uh, because if we represent God, uh, God's truth, we need to be mindful that whatever comes out of our mouth needs to be uplifting it needs to be uh, encouragement it needs to represent and mirror what God calls us to be and if we fail to do so then we're be we're going to be held accountable especially for those who are being who are in a leadership position who may be leading others uh, spiritually we have to be careful and we need to learn how to tame our tongue and I'm going to close off with um, in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 5 through 8 and so uh isaiah chapter 6 verses 5 through 8 this is whenever god calls isaiah he he commissions him as uh as a prophet his commission here so isaiah chapter 6 verses 5 through 8 isaiah speaks woe to me i cried i am ruined for i am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. <clears throat> then one of the seraphims flew to me with the live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, in verse 7, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who sh will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. So Isaiah knew the, the seriousness of his, of his tongue, that his, he had unclean lips, but it was only through that commission you know, that, that God blessed, or God used uh, 
he, he touched Isaiah in a way for him to, to be commissioned to go and to speak as a prophet. And so Isaiah had this understanding of the seriousness of the tongue where it, just like James talks about here, how it can be, um, it can be the difference, it can, you know, it can be the difference between uh, salvation and damnation. And so uh, when Isaiah understood this, it was only then that God was able to, to use him to, to go and to prophesy for his name. And uh, I love that example here because uh, what we can learn, you know, how to, to tame our tongues, we can do mighty things. Amen. Amen. Any comments or questions? My two favorite were the examples of the spark and the, the thief. I mean, it, it's such a great illustration of, you know, one or the other. Mm -hmm. Those, it's kind of like the fork in the road, right? When you're trying to get the 1604 heading towards your house, if I take, if I get, I think it's the left one. See, I still always, I always forget. Mm -hmm. But it, it makes a difference. It'll take you down a whole other road. Yeah, and I know you've lived in California, so you know the seriousness of wildfires. I'm sure like a small spark can, you know, yeah. create a big disaster. And, you know, so it goes um, with, you know, these other examples. And so um, just, you know, and I think that's what James is really trying to emphasize here. Just learning how to tame your tongue because as small as, as, small as significant it can, may be for, for us as, as, as humans, it has a mighty power to do uh, great things and when we can learn to use it correctly uh, we can use that to inspire and to uh, speak the truth and to to lead those who are lost uh, but um, any final comments or questions before I close okay well we'll go ahead and close out here and uh, I'm hoping y'all can stay tuned for next week but uh, let's go to the Lord Lord Father we we come to you this morning thanking you for allowing us to, to, to study your word, Lord. And uh, Lord, let us always remember the, the powerful uh, our, our words can be, Lord, for you yourself, you, you came to this world and you spoke truth. By your mouth, you, you uh, progressed that you were Lord and God in the flesh, Lord. And let us always remember uh, the seriousness of this in our lives, where we, when we speak to loved ones or when we, we guide our children, so that we can speak to them in a way where you have us, where, where you would want us to speak in the same manner. Uh, Lord, let us um, um, use this time to, to glorify you for us to sing and to praise you and ask that you would just allow your spirit to dwell here uh, in your church here. Uh, we thank you for all that you do. In your son's name we ask. Amen.